Tashi Dilek, welcome to the eighth and the last day of the week-long virtual talk series on the four principal commitments of His Holiness the Great 14th Dalai Lama. This initiative by the Department of Information and International Relations Central Tibetan Administration is a part of the celebration of the year 2020 as the year of gratitude to His Holiness the Great 14th Dalai Lama. On today's panel, we have Venerable Tenzin Priyadarshi, President and the CEO of the Dalai Lama Center for Ethics and Transformative Values at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Dr. Deepak Chopra, MD and the founder of the Chopra Foundation, Demboy Genze Zamla, Joint Secretary and Environment Researcher at Tibet Policy Institute, and Geshe Yishe Gawa, Co-Founder and Director of Tibet Open House Prague. Namaskar. It is truly a delight and honor to have this opportunity to share some thoughts on His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama's first commitment, which is promotion of human values. I'm thankful to the Department of Information and International Relations at CTA to request and invite me to do so, and it is truly a delight. We are truly blessed to live in a time when His Holiness the Dalai Lama is with us. He's a beacon of moral leadership, not just for the Buddhists, but for the entire world. And there are very few leaders who occupy the stature as the great 14th. So when His Holiness speaks of promotion of human values, he's not trying to suggest promotion of a particular group of human values, or a particular tribe of human values. We are precisely at a state in human civilization where we must try to move beyond tribal values. It's necessary both for the evolution of human civilization and for evolution of us as individuals. You see, the promotion of human values, we shouldn't think of it as something that all 7 billion plus human beings will adhere to. It's difficult, challenging, almost impossible to draw a consensus around which values will be beneficial to everyone. However, what we can agree on is perhaps that there are certain shared values which if we see more in our society, it will be good for the well-being of society at large. Meaning that our society perhaps can do with more kindness, more compassion, more trust, more empathy, and so on. And so, when we speak of human values, it is not in juxtaposition to any other values of any other species, meaning it's not suggesting that human values somehow are going to be superior to any other species. You see, we have to recognize that nature by itself is amoral, meaning that any conversation, any discussion around morality, around uh, a set of values that is truly beneficial to a particular species is something that falls in human domain. And hence, even the sense of responsibility as to what forms of values might we strengthen, which is not only beneficial to humans, but to other species as well. Meaning, values that actually have planetary implications. The first thing is the method, the pedagogy of how we actually come to recognize these values. Now, we have, as His Holiness has often suggested, that we may derive the roots of our values, of our understanding of values that we cherish, either from religion, family system, nation boundaries, and so on. However, we must actually come to a stage where we are deeply reflective of these values. Deeply reflective of values in a sense that what happens when a value that I as an individual hold dear collides 
with values of other humans. What is the role of tolerance? What is the role of acceptance in those kinds of circumstances? You must deeply reflect on where do values actually come from? How do we learn them? How do we cultivate them? That it should not be simply a matter of belief. It should be a matter of proper reflection, whether those values are still relevant, who do they benefit, and so on. You see, we live in a time when human values are perhaps akin to civic values, meaning when we talk about promotion of human values, we're actually thinking about promotion of civic values beyond the boundaries of religion, families, nation, and so on. But it is not to suggest that they are mutually exclusive. We live in a time when we must deeply reflect on what our world would look like in the absence of such values. You see, for example, our civic society today, in all parts of the world, for the most part, are torn apart. Torn apart by polarized conversations torn apart by kind of a tribal sense. That we haven't, in some ways, evolved out of this notion of being tribal. Now, we all know that, you know, yes, humans have the neurological or biological disposition to empathy, but if that practice of empathy or that manifestation of empathy is simply dictated by our tribal sensibilities, meaning that I can only be empathetic and kind to other individuals who look like me, who talk like me, who believe in the same things. Then we would never actually understand the universal value of kindness and compassion because we are all tied into this tribal sense of empathy. And so it is important that when we speak of human values, that we must think of it as not something that should just be focused on benefiting a particular group of individuals. Otherwise, we will continue to divide the society at a much faster pace. And not only dividing the society, but we would not understand what values are actually needed to create a mechanism of flourishing for our ecosystem, where the value of greed and deceit might become much more heavier than value of kindness and values of generosity. And then we end up in this lopsided relationship with our climate, with our planet. So His Holiness the Dalai Lama for many years has been selflessly promoting this idea and mostly urging many educational institutions around the world to deeply think of mechanisms by which we can instill such learning. Meaning it is not, again, a matter of just a belief system. Values are not something that ought to be simply prescriptive, as we have seen it traditionally. Meaning humans, we learn sometimes better with prescriptions, but other times the retention of anything that we learn comes uh, with a sense of deep reflection, with a sense of critical thinking, and so on. And so it's not just enough for us to suggest that, oh, kindness is good or compassion is good, but we have to come up with sort of a mechanism by which both young and old are able to reflect, critically reflect, on such value propositions. And then understand the tools by which we can cultivate these values. And cultivation aspect is again something of tremendous importance. Meaning that we may all possess baseline level of kindness, baseline level of trust, baseline level of compassion. But there's nothing stopping us, there's nothing inhibiting us to grow in it. You see, the challenge becomes when 
we become complacent and suggest to ourselves that I have enough kindness and I have enough trust. Then we don't seek to strengthen it further. And that's one of the things that we have to recognize that part of the exploration or curiosity around human values has to do with challenging this complacent mindset. You see, for example, trust. Again, in a tribe, trust oftentimes is a given. People believe in the same things. They may have the same ideal. They may have the same goals and ambitions. But when you're living in a complex society with different demographics, trust needs to be built. Civic society is a reflection of trust in society. Democracy is a reflection of trust in civic society. So we have to recognize that any institution, any civic institution, such as democracy or legal system or judicial system, anything that we build can only advance at the speed of human trust. If it lacks trust, then none of these institutions are going to be viable in the short and long term. But how do we teach people to trust. We cannot prescribe them to trust. We cannot tell them that, oh, you should just trust another person as if it is a given, especially when people have been oppressed, especially when people have been harmed. You see, so that now requires us to go deeper into cultivation and understanding of values such as forgiveness, values of resilience, to be able to then think about how do we build and rebuild and strengthen trust in each other and in civic institutions. These are the things that His Holiness has prompted many of us to think about. And he is, of course, a wonderful presence of encouragement that we should not think of human values just for the sake of religiosity of things. It is necessity for survival of species, but it is much more a necessity for survival of the planet as we know it. We have seen, you see, the challenges that we are facing with lack of values. But it's not necessarily lack of values, it's simply the manifestation of some other values. You see, we humans, we don't operate out of lack of values. There are good or useful values and there are not so useful values. And much of our decision making happens by being informed by a certain set of values. One of those challenges that we are facing these days a lot is the aspect of biases, human biases. And again, it is deeply rooted in the sense of tribal biases, where we begin to see superficial distinctions between one and the other, which gives sort of rise to racial tensions, which gives rise to racial divide, and so on. And so when we talk about promotion of human values, it challenges those deep-rooted, deep-seated, implicit biases. That we as humans, that if we are going to talk about a more compassionate society, a more reflective society, we must learn, we must train to reflect and regulate these deep-rooted biases. If not, completely eliminate them. Otherwise, again, any institution that we built would reflect these biases. Much of my work these days has been around sort of this intersection of humanity and technology, which in the last hundred years, you see, uh, has been sort of crucial in terms of human development. But as we are looking at what development is, 
it raises again certain fundamental questions. Meaning that our singular preoccupation or obsessiveness with GDP of a country is that development. Because, as you see, GDP of a country does not really tell us much about the well-being of the country. It simply says that the country is advancing economically. It's one set of metrics. It doesn't tell us much about the value of the society. It may tell us something about the work ethic of the society, but it doesn't tell us much about the value of the society. What do citizens of those societies actually truly cherish? It doesn't tell us about the level of well-being that is dominant in that society. Are people happy? Are people content? Are people actually trusting of one another? And so we have come to a point where we need to begin to push ourselves to think about developing and studying other forms of metrics. And in that spirit, again, it is important to look at a set of human values and see how we, as humans, as individuals and as a society are performing on those indicators, on those markers. But at the same time, we must recognize something that is often reflected in His Holiness's uh, words and speeches, is that the way we think of kindness, the way we think of compassion, that it should not just be limited to metrics. Metrics gives a certain understanding around development of tools to promote such qualities, such traits in individuals. However, there's a sense of limitlessness that we, as humans, can also cultivate. And what I mean by limitlessness, again, is that it is, firstly, this ability to overcome our own biases, this ability to be able to empathize, to be kind, to be compassionate to others who don't belong to the same tribe. Meaning that because of this limitlessness, one is able to push the boundaries, if not eliminate the boundaries uh, that exist between I and the other. And again, it is a prerequisite for the flourishing of a complex system, for a complex society, that differences should be respected. But differences should not inhibit us from further understanding one another. That these differences should not create more polarization. These differences should not create more distrust in environment that leads to a sense of harm. And this is one of the things that I think is very timely, very relevant, that most institutions should start reflecting on, whether it's education, whether it's governance, whether it's uh, economic systems as well. Meaning that what are the values that we truly hold dear? What are the values that we truly cherish? The second part of it to, to recognize is that even if we don't build a consensus, which we probably won't, it is important to preserve the voice of dissent. You see, that we should not think overwhelmingly that you know, the voice of the majority is the only voice that matters. As we have seen in history of human civilizations, that at times the voice of dissent, the voice of the minority, were perhaps the right voice. Meaning that consensus may lead us to understand the legality of systems where we agree on certain terms, but we should also understand fundamentally that what is legal may not be moral or ethical, that it has a compass of its own. And hence, it is important that we listen to voice of dissent. We preserve them for further discussions and deliberations. That when we talk about promotion of human values, that it is again not an agreeable sense. You see, even in the Buddhist order, as early as when the historical Buddha was alive, we can see voice of dissent even in the Sangha. 
You see? But Buddha encouraged it. Buddha allowed for those voices to exist because they are also representative of a certain set of values. The last thing that I, I would just briefly touch on is that this, this idea again that in civic society, one of the things that is the role of government and systems is to impart a feeling of safety, a feeling of fearlessness to its citizens. That we cannot govern by fear. We cannot govern by fear of punitive damages and so on. That is not sign of a healthy society. And therefore, it is important for us to think about mechanisms by virtue of which we can create a more self-aware society. A self-aware society that also has ability to self-regulate. A self-aware society that can self-regulate needs to re rely on such propositions, which is human values. And based on those values, based on the understanding of those values, we would flourish and we would flourish together. The life and work of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, has been inspiring. It will continue to inspire many of us. And one of the most wonderful things that we get to observe is his presence. He truly embodies the struggles, he truly embodies the values that he's trying to encourage others to manifest. And that is something that also we need to learn about how do we nurture such embodiment of values. Meaning that it is okay for us to occasionally do acts of kindness, occasionally show our trust for somebody, occasionally be encouraging. But to embody those values such that we become a presence of kindness, we become a presence of trust, that we are able to impart the sense of fearlessness by our mere presence. That is something that we see wonderfully reflected in the personality of the great 14th. I'm deeply grateful. I'm humbled to have been a student, a disciple, to be able to learn, to reflect, and to contribute in small ways towards this particular commitment of promotion of human values. So we should recognize that no matter what the roots of our values may be, whether we got them from our parents, from our ancestors, from our tribes, from our religious belief systems, and so on. We must reflect on its relevance. We must reflect on what sort of impact is it creating in our world. And that constant ability to reflect, that constant ability to self-correct, is what makes us fundamentally human. You see, we will stop growing as humans if we stop this mechanism for self-correction. This mechanism that allows us to transform ourselves for better, not only as humans, but also as civic citizens and civic society. So, it's not that there is a shortage of talk on human values. 
But the way His Holiness the Dalai Lama has presented this commitment reminds us of the time that we live in, the era in which these values are necessary for us to move on, to move beyond. This pandemic has taught us the value of embracing uncertainty. It has taught us the value of resilience. It has reminded us the value of kindness, how much it could better our day, how much it could better somebody else's day. So these are not too complex of a system in terms of its cultivation, its nurturing. But each one of us must take the responsibility to do so. And institutions should facilitate this particular process. And that is an encouragement that we see coming from the great 14th to world leaders, to world governments, to find ways to promote more kindness, more compassion, more trust, more fearlessness in our world, in our society. While His Holiness is with us, we should engage with a level of honesty and integrity in reflecting around these values, making sure that this is something that not only we struggle with on a regular basis, but even organizations that we lead, organizations that we are part of, are reflecting an effort to promote such values. We are truly blessed. We are truly fortunate. And I sincerely hope that His Holiness will continue to guide us and encourage us in years to come. He is truly a leader, a teacher who belongs to the world. I'm grateful to the Department of Information and International Relations at CTA for this opportunity to briefly share some thoughts on this commitment of the Great 14th on promotion of human values. Thank you. I'm Dr. Deepak Chopra, and I'm very honored and privileged to participate in this year of gratitude to His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So I'm very grateful to the organization, uh, the Central Tibetan Administration, for hosting this year of gratitude to His Holiness. So I have known His Holiness for the last um, at least three decades or more, have met him on several occasions in different parts of the world. And I have to start by saying is I'm deeply grateful just for his presence. Just being in his presence begins a journey of peace and gratitude and love and compassion and kindness and joy and equanimity. I know that uh, His Holiness has uh, four principal commitments, and I would like to read them to you. The first commitment is to promote peace and compassion. The second com commitment is to spread that compassion and harmony amongst world religions. The first commitment again, peace, compassion, and happiness. The second, to spread that compassion amongst world religions. The third is to carry a message of love amongst the violence in today's world. And the fourth is the preservation of Tibetan culture and values. So first of all, I have to say that obviously uh, these are the most important and worthy commitments that a human being can make to our collective humanity, to our collective consciousness. And... Uh, Throughout his life, His Holiness has been doing this 
uh, not only as a human being, but also as an example. You know, peace can only be created by those who are peaceful. I know this. His Holiness has a Nobel Prize in peace, but I know a lot of Nobel laureates who are not at peace with themselves. So peace can only be created by those who have inner peace. And one of the values that uh, His Holiness has brought to the world, of course, is uh, the practice itself of meditation. Uh, we know that His Holiness has promulgated uh, meditation practices, vipassana, insight meditation, meditation on compassion, meditation on loving kindness, meditations on equanimity, meditations on peace and joy. And all of these meditations now, uh, we know scientifically, uh, have uh, very profound effects on our brain. Uh, there's rewiring of our brain, there's neuroplasticity, and some of our research at the Chopra Foundation now supports the fact that is now accepted by scientists, and we have been part of this um, scientific research as well, is that meditation um, activates the genes in our body that are responsible for self-regulation, homeostasis, and healing. Meditation also increases the levels of the enzyme telomerase, which uh, regulates our biological clock for aging. In our study, uh, which was looking at uh, Vipassana and other kinds of meditations as well, we found a 40% increase in telomerase that affects uh, biological aging. 40% increase. There's no, there's no drug that does that. The study was supported um, with uh, many scientists um, and collaborations at Harvard, at UCSF, at uh, US, UCSD, at Scripps. And fundamentally, um, it showed that all genes that are responsible for healing go up dramatically. By healing, I mean homeostasis and self-regulation. All genes that cause inflammation go down significantly. The biological effects of meditation include uh, lowering of blood pressure, uh, fine-tuning of the immune system, uh, regulation of hormones, and today we know that only 5% of disease-related gene mutations are fully penetrant, which means they guarantee disease. 95% of gene mutations that uh, are associated with chronic disease, whether it's diabetes, obesity, metabolic syndrome, autoimmune illnesses, uh, inflammatory disorders, Alzheimer's, and many types of cancer, all those genes actually get down-regulated through meditation. So the future of well-being will have to include meditation and also practices like loving-kindness and compassion for the general biological well-being of a human being, but also of society, because there's no social transformation in the absence of personal transformation. And when a critical mass of uh, people go through that personal transformation, then uh, we have the possibility of a more peaceful, sustainable, joyful, um, healthier, happier world. Which uh, brings me um, to His Holiness's second mission. The first, of course, was to spread happiness in the world. The second, as a Buddhist monk, he's encouraged, encouraging everyone for harmony in the world. As a Buddhist monk, His uh, Holiness is committed to harmony, harmony amongst the world's religions. And these are some of the points I've learned from His Holiness. Despite philosophical differences between them, all major religions have the same potential to create good human beings. It is therefore important for all religions to respect one another and recognize the value of their respective traditions. The idea that there is one truth and one religion is relevant to the individual practitioner. However, with regard to the wider community, His Holiness says there is a need to recognize that human beings observe several religions and several aspects of 
the truth. So having read His Holiness's uh, important message, I have only one thing to add, that truth is one. There are many roads to it. And all these different religions are many roads to uh, that truth. And that truth is that consciousness or pure being or um, awareness is fundamental reality. We call it by many names, pure consciousness, in some religions, God, Ein Sof, Allah, um, so many names, Dharma Kaya, uh, you know, we know these words. And these words kind of condition us to think that the ideal goal of religion in one religion is different from another religion, but it isn't. If you look at the religious experience, whether it's Buddhist experience or Christian experience or Muslim experience or Jain experience um, or the Gnostic experience, um, it doesn't matter. The fundamental experience is transcendence, finding deep peace in your inner being, what is called the peace that passes understanding, which is overshadowed by the turbulence of the mind. So when we go beyond the turbulence of the mind, beyond the secret passages and the dark alleys and the ghost-filled attics of the turbulent mind, then we find the peace that uh, the Buddha talked about, nirvana. Uh, other religions call it the peace that passes understanding of all kinds. So that's the first religious experience. Everybody acknowledges that that is a deep spiritual experience that changes the way we look at the world. The second aspect of the religious experience is what we call the emergence of Platonic values. Uh, Platonic as in Plato, the Greek philosopher, and Platonic values include truth, goodness, beauty, harmony, love, compassion, joy, equanimity. All those happen when we get in touch with the inner being inside us, which is universal. One being, numerous minds, numerous perspectives, numerous bodies, numerous uh, ways of thinking, numerous ways of knowing, numerous philosophies, numerous scientific validations. But at the core of all of this is the singularity of consciousness, uh, nirvana, the peace that passes understanding. Nirvana also means transcendence and it automatically leads to these amazing divine qualities and in Buddhism, of course, they are loving kindness, empathy, compassion, joy, equanimity. When we experience these divine qualities, we feel holy, we feel healed, we feel whole. And the third aspect of uh, of religious experience is what we call loss of the fear of death because fear of death comes from false perception, misperception of fundamental reality, which is beyond every human construct, beyond our interpretations of sensations, images, feelings, thoughts, a deeper reality that we can access. And when we access that, um, we lose the fear of death that comes from the fragmented, separate self. So His Holiness uh, spreading harmony across the world brings peace. Peace, harmony, laughter, love are all entangled as emotions. When you bring harmony, you bring healing as well. Thirdly, His Holiness uh, is Tibetan and as the Dalai Lama, He's the focus of the Tibetan people's hope and trust. Therefore, he's committed to preserving Tibetan language and culture, the heritage Tibetans receive from the masters of India's Nalanda University, while also speaking up for the protection of Tibet's natural environment. Nothing is more important than preserving this deep culture. And so, of course, as one of His Holiness's disciples, I have been involved with 
um, the Tibet House in the United States. Uh, I know of Tibet House in London, and I know of all the amazing uh, work that uh, all these various uh, uh, aspects of uh, the Tibetan culture movement uh, and its preservation are how important they are. And the museums of the world and the scholars of the world at this moment are very keen to preserve this amazing culture uh, which has ancient roots but is finding direct relevance in a world that is today threatened by extinction, threatened by climate change, threatened by social and economic injustice, threatened by pandemics, threatened by economic crises, only, only cultural wisdom that is so profound, even though it is 2,500 years old, that cultural wisdom today is finding relevance in a postmodern world. We have uh, many problems in the world, conflict, eco-destruction, extinction of species, destruction of natural environments, climate change. And unless we go back to the wisdom of the cultural traditions, we are embarking on a road which is very dangerous and could spell extinction for the human species. The last extinction occurred about 65 million years ago when a meteorite fell from, um, from outer space on our planet and caused the equivalent of an atomic bomb. And dinosaurs, the dominant uh, species of the planet at that time, were wiped out in one hour. Today, we have the capacity to do that 25 times over. So, if you're not careful, modern capacities and fragmented, tribal, selfish thinking can lead to the next extinction. Only the deep wisdom of culture from such a rich tradition, Tibet, Nalanda University, and all the way back to Gautama Buddha and his enlightenment, is more relevant today than ever before in the history of humanity. And finally, His Holiness has also lately spoken of his commitment to reviving awareness of the value of ancient Indian knowledge amongst young Indians today. His Holiness is convinced that the rich Indian understanding, rich ancient Indian understanding of the workings of the mind and emotions, as well as the techniques of mental training such as meditation, developed by Indian traditions are of great relevance today. Since India has a long history of logic and reasoning, His Holiness is confident that its ancient knowledge viewed from a secular academic perspective can be combined with modern education. I have to say that His Holiness has already been doing this for the last 30 years with neuroscientists, with geneticists, with biologists, and with scientists from all areas of, uh, of uh, scientific discipline, not just biology, but physics and neuroscience and genetics and epigenetics. So the fact that His Holiness considers India as being special and uh, as being able to provide both scholarly and practical uh, wisdom uh, of ancient and modern modes of knowing in a fruitful way that is more integrated and ethically grounded today in a secular world is very encouraging that uh, His Holiness wants to uh, take the Indian knowledge and combine it with the contributions of the Buddhist traditions of the world um, so that uh, all of humanity can benefit. So from my side, all I have to say is I personally feel indebted to His Holiness and the work he has done through all these decades that I have uh, known of his presence in this world. This deep gratitude goes beyond anything that can be acknowledged. It is felt here deep in the heart. And what His Holiness has done very effectively is bring the heart 
and the mind and the intellect and reason and logic uh, together with amazing practices and inspired the whole world to be the change they want to see in the world. I have been a student of Buddhist traditions, but I'm also a student of the Kabbalah. I'm a student of Vedanta, of Kashmir Shaivism, and also of, um, of the great Gnostic Christian traditions and the teachings of Jesus Christ as well, along with the teachings of the other great prophets, including the Buddha, and just about everyone, excluding the great traditions of Islam and the teachings of the Prophet. Um, so what can I say? His Holiness is sacrificing or has sacrificed his entire life to bring all these traditions to, together and explore their common roots in the religious experience. The religious experience is universal the spiritual experience is universal. It acquires different modes of expression depending on geography, history, culture, economics, and many other things. As human beings, it is our responsibility to preserve all these traditions. And I know of no one in the world who has done this more responsibly, more gently, more lovingly, more uh, compassionately uh, than His Holiness. So please join me in congratulating His Holiness, acknowledge gratitude for His contributions and recognize that we may use different words, Nirmana Kaya, Dharma Kaya, Sambhoga Kaya, Theosphere, biosphere, noosphere, body, mind, spirit, matter, intelligence, consciousness. We are all saying, this, saying the same thing in different words. It is thanks to His Holiness and the collaboration that He has brought about that will cause emergence. Emergence happens in society when an old story is, dies. The old story is predation and conquest and, uh, and uh, control and manipulation and the new story is cooperation and love and compassion and joy. So emergence happens when there's shared vision, where everybody complements each other's strengths and where everyone connects emotionally and spiritually. His Holiness has been the leader in the emergence of what I can only call a new humanity. Reimagining humanity. Let us all do it. Let us all be cheerleaders and teammates of the great pioneering leadership that His Holiness has shown in every sphere of life, whether it's spiritual or political or just leadership for families, friends, communities, and the whole world. Deep gratitude to His Holiness, and I remain ever grateful for having the opportunity to be in your presence so many times. Today, I'm extremely honored and privileged to be a part of this wonderful program to express our gratitude to His Holiness the Dalai Lama for his lifelong service for the good of humanity. As a Tibetan and also as an environmentalist, there is no word that could accurately describe our gratitude to His Holiness for his lifelong dedication towards environment conservation. I would also like to thank the Department of Information and in international relations for bringing out such a wonderful event. Such event would give us a great opportunity to learn and to reflect on His Holiness's immense contribution towards religious harmony, world peace, human values, and of course, environmental conservation. 
Today I will try to speak on His Holiness the Dalai Lama's lifelong dedication towards environmental conservation. In 20 minutes or so, I can hardly touch on the enormous efforts His Holiness put towards environmental conservation. So I will try to briefly touch on five important points that could highlight his dedication and determination to serve in whatever way possible for a more sustainable, eco-friendly, and a healthy life for all. Now I'm going to focus on five point, important points to highlight His Holiness environmental works. Number one, commitment His Holiness had towards environment conservation. Number two, proposals His Holiness made for a better environment. And number three, recognitions His Holiness received for his environmental contributions. Number four, efforts His Holiness made on environmental conservation works. Finally, number five, impact His Holiness had on environment protection. Now to speak in a little more detail on each of the five points just highlighted above. The point number one, commitments His Holiness had towards environment conservation. For any tangible result on environment conservation or any work, a firm commitment towards that issue is paramount. And for His Holiness, environment conservation has always be, been an important issue that he had strong commitment to serve. Which is why environment conservation is one of the main commitments in his life. As we all know, that His Holiness the Dalai Lama has been voted as the most respected, admired, and influential living figure in the world, time and again. Which means on any issue His Holiness speaks on, would naturally amplify the support and the attention of the global community. Like myself, millions of his followers could have been influenced by His Holiness' work towards environment conservation in some way or the other. His sense of concern for environment is evident from a 2010 WikiLeaks publication in which His Holiness said to the then U.S. Ambassador to India that political issues of Tibet can wait for another five to ten years, but not the environmental degradation currently happening in Tibet. Now this statement underlines His Holiness' strong commitment towards environment making it more urgent and important than political issues. As a researcher, I have often wondered what could have influenced His Holiness the Dalai Lama's commitments towards environment. Now this could be very interesting for many of you and it was very interesting for me. His Holiness the Dalai Lama was born on fifth day of the fifth month as per the calendar, that is on 6th July 1935. Now, fifth day of the fifth month, as per Tibet calendar, is midsummer in Tibet. Summers in Tibet are probably the most beautiful time and place in the world in every sense of natural environment. So, His Holiness was born at a beautiful time, in a beautiful place, to a beautiful family. So, as is often the case, the kind of environment or the surrounding in which one grows up influences people's outlook towards nature. So I feel His Holiness's love for nature could have been influenced by people, places, and the culture in which he grew up. This is clear from a book published by His Holiness in 1962 called My Land, My People. In the book His Holiness writes that he remembers very little of the three-month journey he and his family took to travel from his hometown in northeast Tibet to Lhasa in northwest Tibet. But His Holiness remembers something from that journey, which he fondly recalls in the book. To quote from the same book, I remember very little detail apart from a great sense of wonder at everything I saw. The vast herds of wild yaks grazing across the plains, the smaller groups of chang and occasionally a herd of antelopes, blue sheep and deers. 
I also loved the huge flocks of hooting geese we saw from time to time. Beautiful. The journey was taken in 1935 when His Holiness was only four years old. But he could remember the wild animals he saw on the journey. This experience may not have been the only factor that influenced His Holiness' outlook towards nature, but it could have been one of the many factors that influenced His Holiness. The usage of words in the book clearly indicate that his love for nature and wild animals he saw on the journey. The commitments towards environment protection is also clear from the numerous efforts His Holiness put forth ever since he took political responsibility of Tibet in 1950. First, His Holiness ordered forest protection and banned hunting during independent Tibet prior to Chinese occupation. Second, His Holiness ended poultry farming and supported vegetarian movement in exiled Tibet community. Number three, His Holiness called for tree protection and wildlife protection in Tibet. His Holiness also was the first Tibetan to speak on Tibet's environmental importance at global stage. And fifth, His Holiness has urged global cooperation on climate change at numerous occasions, which to my understanding makes His Holiness the earliest and the most consistent environmentalist. Now to speak on the second point, proposals for a better environment. His Holiness brought out a fabulous proposal during an address to U.S. Congressional Human Rights Caucus in 1987. In his famous five-point peace plan, His Holiness proposed for creation of Tibet as a zone of peace for both men and nature. The five-point peace plan also states, quote, It is my sincere desire, as well as that of Tibetan people, to restore to Tibet her invaluable role by converting the entire country, comprising the three provinces, Wuzhang, Kham, and Amdo, once more into a place of stability, peace and harmony. The proposal also adds that Tibet would extend its services and hospitality to all who further the cause of world peace and well-being of uh, mankind and, of course, the natural environment we share. The natural environment we share. Now, this is important uh, because almost whole of Asia and much of the world, some way or the other, depend on or benefit from a good ecological condition on the Tibet Plateau. As it has also been highlighted by scientists in recent years that the current global climatic pattern is greatly influenced by what's happening on the Tibet Plateau and that almost all of Ishi, Southeast Asian countries are dependent on Tibetan rivers for their livelihood. So, creating Tibet as a zone of peace not only benefits Tibet, but it also benefits much of the world and, of course, almost all of Asia. According to the fourth point in the Five Point Peace Plan, it states that serious effort must be made to restore the natural environment in Tibet and, uh, and that Tibet should not be used for production of nuclear weapons and dumping of nuclear waste. The proposal received great admiration and support from global leaders, scholars, and international community. Of course, the proposal wasn't accepted by the Chinese government, but it forced the Chinese government to end nuclear production and uh, reduce environmental destruction in Tibet. Now to speak on the third point, recognition for his environmental contribution. His Holiness' sincere commitment towards environment conservation and his great proposal for a better environment has been recognized by numerous governments, institutions, and people across the world. One such recognition is that His Holiness the Dalai Lama was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1989. His Holiness was the first Nobel laureate to be recognized for his environmental contribution. Now, in a, in a press release issued on 5th October 1989, on their decision to award the Nobel Peace Prize to the Dalai Lama, the Norwegian Nobel Committee wrote, I quote, 
The Dalai Lama has developed his philosophy of peace from a great reverence for all things living and upon the concept of universal responsibility, embracing all mankind as well as nature. The press release also adds that, in the opinion of the committee, the Dalai Lama has come forward with constructive and forward-looking proposals for the solution of international conflicts, human rights issues, and of course, global environment problems. The Nobel Committee clearly recognized that His Holiness has come forward with a constructive and forward-looking proposals. Of course, one such proposal is his vision for created bed as a zone of peace for both men and nature, which His Holiness declared in 1987 as part of the famous Five Point Peace Plan. So what better recognition than a Nobel Peace Prize? Now, it is also important to note that Dalai Lama being the first Nobel laureate to be recognized for his environment efforts in 1989, when the environment activism wasn't as popular as it is now. It clearly shows his deep love for and concern for environment conservation, irrespective of whether the issue was popular or not. And now to speak on the fourth point, efforts on, his, on environment conservation. His Holiness made innumerable efforts on environment conservation by speaking on environment and climate change at almost every teachings and public talks he has given in the last many years, particularly since 2011. I will, of course, in no way can highlight all the efforts His Holiness made, but I will try to speak on three such efforts as, a, as an example. First, His Holiness' participation at the Rio Earth Summit in 1992. Second, His Holiness' video message for the Paris Climate Summit in 2015. Third, His Holiness' written message to the delegates of the COP24 UN Climate Summit in 2018. Now to speak uh, in a little more detail on each of the three examples I just mentioned above, First example, His Holiness was invited at the Rio Earth Summit in 1992, which means he was the first Tibetan to speak on Tibet's environment at a global environment conference. During his address uh, at the Rio Earth Summit, uh, His Holiness stated that human beings will have to develop a greater sense of universal responsibility and that each one of us must learn to walk not for his or her self, family or nation, but for the benefit of, of all mankind. Which makes him probably the first prominent global figure to strongly urge international cooperation on climate change as early as 1992. Now the second example, a video message His Holiness sent to the delegates of Paris Climate Summit in 2015. In the video message, His Holiness stated that we human beings are responsible for the current climate crisis and that it is not the question of one nation or two nations, but rather a question of humanity affecting the whole world. Once again, urging for cooperation among the widely divided nations at the summit. It is also in this very message back in 2015 when His Holiness delivered his famous phrase, our world is our only home. Our world is our only home. To quote from the same message, His Holiness states, I quote, Our world is our only home. If this blue planet, due to global warming or some other sort of environmental problem, cannot sustain itself, then there is no other planet where we can move or shift. So this is our only, only home. Beautiful. I had the privilege of being there when this very message was recorded. For me, it was a rare occasion to see and learn from His Holiness what a genuine dedication towards envi environment really means. That one for occasion with His Holiness has also given me the strength and desire to work on environment conservation 
in whatever way I can. Now, the third example. In the 2080, His Holiness sent a written message to the organizers and delegates of the COP24 UN Climate Summit. And in the message, His Holiness wrote, I quote, I extend my greetings and prayers to my dear brothers and sisters, delegates to the 24th Conference of Parties. Now the message further adds, I quote, I would sincerely like to thank all of you who have selflessly and tirelessly put efforts into creating a better environment for the world so that future generations will be able to live a healthy, happy life. I had once again the great privilege of carrying that message from His Holiness to the organizers and the delegates of the UN Climate Summit. In the pictures shown on the screen here, you can see government delegates, UN officials, and NGO leaders happily holding the message from His Holiness. Every delegate I was able to deliver the message from His Holiness was super excited and overjoyed to receive a message of support and appreciation from His Holiness. Now to speak on the fifth point, impacts His Holiness had on environmental protection. Now the success of any work or effort can only be measured by its uh, impact on the ground and His Holiness had massive impact on the ground, particularly in Tibet. In 2006, during the Kala Chakra Puja in South India, His Holiness asked Tibetans in Tibet to stop wearing animal skin decorated clothes, a tradition that was very popular back in Tibet. And the response to His Holiness' call was of unimaginable scale. Tibetans across the plateau came together to pledge that they will never wear animal skin decorated clothes ever again, and they started burning uh, animal skin dresses they had. As someone who was born in Tibet, I have seen its popularity and the desire of every Tibetan in East Tibet to have an animal skin decorated dress before 2006. The popularity of the dress also created a huge animal skin trafficking from India to Tibet, which led to killing of thousands of uh, tiger and leopards in India as stated by animal rights organizations. So had His Holiness not called for an end to it, uh, Tibet would have been flooded with animal skin business, leading to killing of thousands of animals. This surely is one of the biggest impact His Holiness had on pro um, environmental protection. No one could have done it if it wasn't the Dalai Lama. So to conclude, I would like to highlight that after the devolution of uh, political responsibility to an elected lead leader of the Tibet people in 2011, His Holiness said he would continue to devote his life on environmental conservation as one of the main commitments of his life. In his latest book, Our Only Home, A Climate Appeal to the World, His Holiness has stated that if Lord Buddha were to return to this world once again, the Buddha would be green. <laughs> but as someone who has followed, seen and read, and had the rare privilege of uh, receiving few private audience with uh, His Holiness, I would say that His Holiness the Dalai Lama himself is a living Green Buddha. I can also confidently say that His Holiness the Dalai Lama is one of the earliest and the most consistent supporter of environment conservation efforts. He is a real environmentalist. Thank you very much, Your Holiness. Thank you. Tashidli, initially I would like to express my sincere respects and uh, prostration to the spiritual leader of Tibet, uh, His Holiness Great 14th Dalai Lama, and hello to uh, all the viewers and uh, people across the world. Uh, it is my uh, great honor and uh, privilege to have 
such a rare and wonderful opportunity to deliver a speech on uh, His Holiness uh, uh, Dalai Lama's principal commitments uh, as part of uh, my uh, gratitude to uh, His Holiness. As requested by the uh, Department of uh, Religion and Culture, uh, my monastery, Drepun Loslim, has uh, recommended uh, me as one of the speakers for the, uh, for, uh, for the talk series on His Holiness' uh, fourth commitment, uh, the revival of ancient Indian values. Therefore, uh, I would like to uh, offer my appreciation to uh, Drepung Goslin uh, Monastery and CTA, uh, the Central Tibetan Administration, for uh, honoring uh, me uh, with such a, a great opportunity. Uh, as you may be aware, the CTA is uh, hosting uh, this entire year as the year of uh, gratitude to His Holiness Dalai Lama as part of this year loan program. The Department of Information and uh, International Relations is organizing a week long uh, virtual uh, talk series on the uh, Dalai Lama's four principal commitments uh, in multiple uh, languages. Uh, the CTA offered uh, speaker to choose one of the commitments, uh, yes, one of the commitments. Uh, initially, uh, I chose to speak on his first commitment, uh, the promotion uh, of human values. As I have been working on this uh, for a, a long time in Western countries. But uh, then the organizer asked me uh, to speak on, uh, on the fourth commitment, uh, the revival of uh, uh, ancient uh, Indian values. I only became aware of this on November 14th. Therefore, uh, I want to apologize uh, in advance. Uh, I do not have uh, uh, as much time as uh, I had uh, hopeful to prepare uh, for today's uh, talk. Before uh, starting today's topic, uh, I would like to briefly uh, introduce myself and Tibet Open House, where I am right now. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Gishi Ishigawa, uh, Spiritual Director of Tibet Open House in Prague, uh, capital of Czech Republic uh, in Central Europe. I fled to India from Tibet when I was 10 years old. Uh, more than uh, 20 years later, I graduated with uh, a Gishi degree from Drepung Loslin Monastery and uh, Institute of uh, uh, Buddhist Dialectics. I have written four books about uh, uh, Tibet, uh, Tibetan history, uh, Buddhism, uh, and culture. After uh, publishing uh, my first book, uh, I was uh, appointed as uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama's biographer um, from uh, year 2009 to, uh, to 2016. Um, since uh, 2011, 2011, I have traveled to the United States, uh, England, Russia, and uh, many other uh, uh, countries in Europe to give uh, lectures, talk, teachings, 
and uh, to participate in conferences, uh, uh, seminars, and workshops. Uh, we have uh, founded Tibet Open House in the Czech Republic uh, with the support of, uh, of the Lingha Foundation. Our primary uh, goal is to promote uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama's uh, principal commitments, which are intrinsically uh, connected to this topic. We are a multicultural space open to everyone interested uh, in Tibetan history, tradition, arts, uh, philosophy, and uh, 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 religion. Therefore, we offer uh, regular courses in uh, different uh, uh, discipline, uh, like uh, Lojong mind training classes, uh, Buddhist philosophy, uh, Buddhist practice classes, meditations, and uh, as well as uh, three uh, weekly uh, Tibetan language classes. Uh, we host uh, uh, annual Tibetan uh, Buddhist festivities, including uh, Lhasa, uh, His Holiness uh, birthday celebration, uh, and uh, Tibet uh, Festival Day. Uh, we also uh, organize lots of teachings by uh, uh, visiting lamas uh, uh, and geshes from different schools and different traditions, and we uh, invite uh, uh, Soripa experts and uh, Tibetan um, artists as well. Uh, regarding today's topic, uh, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, speak uh, on the importance of uh, a sequence of uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama's principal commitments. And many people uh, do not speak about the uh, uh, importance of uh, sequence, this sequence or order, but uh, uh, from my understanding, this sequence is extremely uh, important. As uh, His Holiness is a human being, his first commitment, his number one commitment is the uh, promotion of human values. As His Holiness is a Buddhist monk, his second uh, commitment is the uh, promotion of uh, religious harmony. And uh, uh, he is a Tibetan and uh, holds uh, the title of Dalai Lama. Uh, so uh, his uh, third commitment is the uh, preservation of uh, uh, Tibetan culture and heritage. Uh, Instead of giving preference to the issue of Tibet, uh, he puts uh, uh, the promotion of human value first. This is an extremely, extremely important and uh, symbolic message for us. Why? Many of today's problem Many of uh, our today's problems are created by our own actions because of our own selfishness, because of the lack of uh, inner uh, values which we are talking about today. We are primarily concerned uh, with our individual's benefit and our own, uh, uh, own nation's interest. 
Men, many politicians are like that. But, but, his honeys always consider interest in our humanity, ecology, global warming, as more important than Tibetan issue. Therefore, the four commitments are not only extremely important, but the order he has chosen for his commitments is equally and perhaps even more significant. Uh, his latest uh, commitment is uh, to the uh, revival of ancient Indian uh, values. India has a long history of Buddhist uh, philosophy, psychology, reasoning, and logic. In the 7th century, Buddhism uh, came to Tibet from India through the uh, master uh, of the Nalendra University, uh, such as uh, 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 Shandarashita and uh, later uh, Atisha Debankara, etc. In India, uh, Buddhism uh, then declined, but uh, uh, fortunately uh, it flourished uh, in Tibet where we have kept it uh, to this day. Um, His Holiness the Dalai Lama has always expressed profound uh, admiration uh, for Asian Indian knowledge, uh, um, for its uh, contribution towards the understanding of the humankind, and for the uh, adoption of practice to tackle uh, negative emotions. His Holiness has even dedicated <clears throat> the rest of the, his life to the pursuit uh, of uh, this uh, humanitarian service. His Holiness has spoken on his uh, commitment uh, to reviving uh, uh, awareness of the value of ancient Indian wisdom among uh, young Indian, Indians today. Uh, His Holiness is convinced uh, that the rich ancient Indian understanding uh, of the workings of the mind and emotion, as well as uh, the techniques of the mental training, such as uh, meditation, uh, developed by uh, Indian tradition, are uh, of great relevance today great relevance today, right? This is true. So he is uh, confident that this ancient knowledge weed from a secular, secular uh, uh, academic perspective can be combined uh, with modern education. Uh, in fact, uh, as a beginning, he considers that India is special, specially able to achieve uh, this combination of uh, ancient and modern modes of knowing in a fruitful way so that uh, more integrated and ethically uh, grounded way of being in the world can be uh, promoted with its uh, contemporary society. So this uh, uh, fruitful way could spread throughout the world. Our world is facing an array of crises, mainly due to a de deficit of moral principle and the failure of modern education. So I would like to repeat this uh, 
once again so far it is important important to recognize we have to recognize so our world is facing an array of crisis mainly due to a deficit of moral principle and the failure of modern education now here i want to share uh, these quotes uh, from his holiness dalai lama so here is the quotation uh, which his holiness dalai lama expressed about uh, uh, today's topic the uh, promotion of, of uh, revival of revival of uh, asian indian knowledge here I'm going to start this uh, quotation. So, existing educational systems are oriented toward material values and materialistic achievements. When we grow up with this learning, we go after power, money, fame. India is the only country which has ability to combine uh, modern technology and science with ancient Indian knowledge to train uh, our mind for more compassion and peace. Thus, in India can play a special role and can make significant contribution for the uh, whole of humanity and better world. So this is a really wonderful quotation, really, really amazing quotation, right? So, uh, uh, His Holiness has uh, uh, called for efforts to revive uh, ancient Indian values and knowledge uh, as part of the educational curriculum. We Tibetan, uh, Tibetans uh, can play a major role by uh, reintroducing uh, these principal inner human values in the line of uh, uh, their origin. This can be done uh, through um, study in the school system purely in the secular context uh, without uh, uh, touching on the religion. So, uh, under the guidance of uh, His Holiness and uh, uh, with the supportive uh, role of uh, uh, Tibetan monasteries and institute, institutes, we have uh, uh, already um, studied the uh, revival of uh, uh, in uh, ancient Indian values uh, in several Indian schools and colleges uh, with uh, notable uh, results uh, in, in students' uh, compassion, uh, warm heartedness, and uh, a sense uh, of uh, responsibility for society. Therefore, we have a moral obligation and uh, responsibility uh, uh, to further develop uh, uh, these activities uh, in India and beyond uh, in order to fulfill uh, uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama's great vision uh, for all of humanity. Uh, before conclusion, uh, this uh, talk, I would like to share uh, another quotation. So there is a great saying, uh, the best expression of gratitude for the uh, master's kindness uh, is to fulfill uh, his instructions as he advised. Therefore, uh, to realize uh, the Dalai Lama's vision of the four commitments uh, will be the uh, best expression of uh, gratitude to His Holiness Dalai Lama. 
So thank you so much and uh, keep safety. Thank you.